So this is the one on angels, and it's I'm doing it out of order, so there'll be evil and providence uh, that I'll come back and do later on. So I don't know what the numbers on the files are, but this one is angels, and it's uh, chapter 16 in, uh, in Erickson's notes. Angels are one of those topics that, when I went to seminary, we didn't spend any time on angels. I mean, zero. We hardly even mentioned it. And demons, we didn't mention at all. So trying to work through this chapter uh, represents something that's biblically important, but it's not so much a part of our society in many cases. And in other places, it's very, very central. If you come to some of the places where spirituality is really important, uh, angels and demons are huge. Uh, when I was in Africa, in Uganda, there, boy, angels and demons are like everywhere and people all over the place are dealing with spirits and angels and witches and shamans and such. But well, it just depends on where you're at, it's what the worldview is. And we come from a kind of a naturalistic worldview here in the United States. And the reality is the Bible is not naturalistic, it is theistic. It's God's creation. And a part of God's creation is angelic beings, and they show up in a lot of different places. So I want to unpack that just a little bit, because actually the scripture doesn't say much about angels, it just describes them doing things. So, well, let's, let's take a look. Let, let me have you look at, at one of the really strange stories that illustrates a lot about what happens to angels. So if you can turn to 2 Kings chapter 6. This is this has got to be one of the strangest stories in all of Scripture. So 2 Kings chapter 6. And so we have Elisha here, and he is with his servant. And they head down to this uh, creek, and there's the king of Aram is at war with Israel, and it's kind of a scary kind of thing. And what happens here is that Elisha's servant, this is verse 15, uh, 2 Kings six fifteen. the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, and there was an army surrounding the city. Oh my gosh, and he is terrified. What are you going to do? The prophet, Elisha, don't be afraid. And then he has a really strange statement. I mean, look at it closely. This is 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 16. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Now, them, of course, is the, the soldiers. Those who are with us, Elisha and his servant, are more than those who are with them, this huge army. What in the world? And then in verse 17, Elisha prays this, Open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. And the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looks and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha, like he's seeing bazillion angels. And the enemy came down toward him. Elisha prayed, Lord, strike his ar this army with blindness. So he did. They're blind. And so Elisha tells him, this is not the road, not the city. Follow me, and I'll lead you. So they enter the city, and then the Lord opened the eyes of these men so they can see. The Lord opened their eyes and they looked and there they were inside Samaria. The king of Israel saw them and said, shall I kill them? So blind servant, I mean, it's a crazy story. Shall I kill him? He says, no, 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 don't kill him. Uh, no, prepare a feast for him. And they do. I mean, this is preparing a feast for your enemy. And when they're done, they eat and they return back to, their, to Aram and they stop raiding. It's a really, really powerful story, but what we see here is there behind the armies, there is a group of angels, apparently associated with each of them, and it's a strange story. Like, how do we make sense of this angel thing? I mean, it's, it's a strange, strange story. Well, let's look just a little bit about what God says about angels. So if you look at Psalm 148, Psalm 148, this is a place where it's talking about God's creation. It's praising Him, uh, and it's just a, it's a powerful story here, Psalm 148. And uh, he says here, praise Him, sun and moon. This is verse 3. Praise Him, shining stars. Praise Him, highest heavens, water above the skies. And then verse says, let them praise the name of the Lord. At His command they were created. He established Him forever and ever. 
So verse 2, praise him, you angels, sun, moon, shining stars, highest heavens, and then let them praise the name of the Lord. Now, sun and moon don't praise, but angels do. So let the angels praise the Lord, for at his command they were created. So here's just a passing reference to angels, referring to them as created beings. Okay, well, that's not real surprising. I, and when you look at that, we think of angels, and, you know, what do we know about them? Uh, well, we see here that they're created. We see them doing very personal kinds of things. Uh, let me, we're going to look at a few stories here. Look at Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. This is the story of the, the birth of Jesus, and here you see Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth, and they have no children. And you get this story fun story happening where Zechariah is chosen to be the priest who goes in the holy place. It's a great honor. And when he goes in there, uh, in verse 11, the angel Lord appeared to him standing the right side. And when he sees this angel, he is afraid. That's pretty typical. And the angel says, your wife's going to have a baby. Well, that's a great idea. There will be great joy, that kind of stuff. And he makes this prophecy. He gives this announcement and Zechariah says, well, how can I be sure of that? Angel says, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of the Lord. So you've got this very powerful angel, and he makes Zechariah mute because he can't believe. But here we have an angel, and what is he doing? He's very personal. He's interacting with Zechariah as a human. He is bringing a message from God, and we find angels do that a lot. Uh, and... Zachariah doesn't receive it properly, so there's a judgment associated with that. He makes him mute. That same angel, down in verse 26, comes to uh, this uh, woman, Mary, to this virgin. And the angel went to her and said, Greetings are you who are highly flavored. The Lord is with you. Mary is greatly troubled. Don't be afraid. Because that's what you do. In response to angels, you're afraid because they're very powerful. And he gives a message. It's really powerful. And she asks, how can I do this? Because I'm a virgin. You're like, I don't, I'm not going to get married here for a while. The angel says, don't worry about it. We'll take care of the details. That to conceive in your womb would be the Holy One of God. So what do you see with angels doing? They're serving God. They are loving God. They're bringing messages to humans. Uh, They're executing judgment of humans. Uh, that's the sort of thing that angels do do. And we find later on in Luke chapter 2, after the birth of Jesus, we get the angels up in the heaven and they're singing praise to God. So that's another thing they do. The summary statement is in Hebrews chapter 1. Take a look at that. Hebrews chapter 1. It's a long story here in Hebrews on angels. And it makes it really clear that Christ is higher than the angels. But Hebrews 1.14 uh, it summarizes, are not all angels ministering spirits sent to those to serve those who inherit salvation. So this is the heart of angels. They're messengers and they serve particularly saved people and they execute judgment. Uh, in Acts chapter 12 we find Herod uh, getting too big for his own britches as we'd say in Missouri and claiming that he is God and an angel strikes him down right on the spot and it worms in his belly. I get some people I'd like to have an angel do worm in the belly routine because they're bad people. Uh, I'd rather see them, of course, receive Jesus and bad people becoming good people. Of course, that's what makes me happy. Uh, but this is what angels do. So they're created, they're personal, they carry messages, they serve people, and they execute God's judgment. Basic ministry of angels. Uh, what else do we know about angels? Well, there's a lot we know. They're they're spiritual, they're ministering spirits, but they're not ghosts. A uh, ghost, as we understand it, is a spirit of a human that departs the human, and at least in mythology, they wander around. I think of uh, Ebenezer Scrooge interacting in, in Christmas Carol, uh, and the ghost of Christmas past, present, and future come to him, and Marley is, I was a bad boy, so I'm carrying my chains, and that kind of stuff. Uh, and if I'm in the Eastern world, in Taiwan, for example, they really believe in ghosts, the departed human spirits that are unhappy and troubling and can be very difficult. So we just went through Ghost Month in the, in the 
in Taiwan where they're trying to appease the angry spirits. So that's ghosts, and angels are not ghosts. Angels are created beings, created by God, and they're special. They're not ghosts, uh, spirits of humans. Now, I don't think that spirits of humans wander around. I think that when we die, the spirit of human goes to a, another spot, uh, either to be with Jesus, if you're a believer, or to go to a, a place called Hades, a place of punishment. We see that in Luke 16. Uh, but even if you do believe in ghosts, departed human spirits, they're not angels. They're categorically different. They're personal. They can interact, but they're not human, and they do interact with humans. They're created, Psalm 148, for example, but uh, they're not immortal in the sense that they had a beginning. No, we don't see them dying. We do see them punished. Second Peter chapter 2 talks about Angels who are judged, they're bound up in chains and Tartarus, uh, another place for punishment after death. Uh, so they appear to be like humans that they never go out of existence, but they have a beginning. They are powerful, but they're not omnipotent. They all serve with the action of God. Uh, they're knowledgeable, they know a lot, uh, but they're not omniscient, that only God knows everything. Uh, and there's a lot of them. I mean, we get some really funny stories about the numbers of angels. Uh, and so you get, well, let's look at a passage, Revelation chapter 5. Some of these numbers are, especially in Revelation where they're uh, symbolic numbers. Revelation 5, 11. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands, ten thousands times ten thousand, and uses the largest number in the Greek language, ten thousand. And he says 10,000 times 10,000. So there's many of them that are circling the throne and they're singing praise to the Lamb, which is a, another thing that angels do. So that would be something, a picture of that. Uh, one kind of critical question in this thing is, are there such things as guardian angels? Uh, are there angels that are individually assigned uh, to people to guard them? Uh, it's fairly widely held that that's the case. Uh, but why, well, let's look at the passage, because I'm a Bible geek. Okay, so turn over Matthew chapter 18, and let's just take a look at this. Uh, Matthew chapter 18. Uh, at the time the disciples came to Jesus, who's the greatest of the kingdom? He calls a little child, unless you become like the children of every in the kingdom. Uh, that's a cool picture. I really like kids, and I think this is a good idea. And he goes on, who welcomes these as welcomes in my name, welcomes me. The one who caused the little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better to have a large millstone hung around their neck and they'd be drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world by people who cause people to stumble. And, of course, that's true. People who cause others to stumble. I mean, that's, that's a terrible sin. It's not an unforgivable sin, but uh, hurting other people, of course, bad thing to do. And these are ones who hurt particularly little ones. And he says, you've got to deal with your sin. If your hand or foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. Now he's teaching allegorically or metaphorically. He's not saying actually cut your hand off. But what he is saying, if your hand is doing bad things, you've got to stop it. And the power of the Holy Spirit gives us that power to stop and change the heart. But then he says something really interesting in verse 10. See that you not despise one of these little ones, for I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. And that's the passage that becomes a, a, a groundwork for understanding that there are individual angels assigned to people. And so, especially for children, they're angels in heaven. So is this saying that each child has an angel individually assigned to it? Uh, that's possible. That's possible. Uh, but when I read this, uh, it seems to me that the point here is that these angels are in heaven, not here on earth taking care of the kids. And the point is, it seems to me, that if you punch a kid in the night in a bedroom, for example, and nobody sees it, the point of it is you won't get away with it because God knows and these angels are tattletales in heaven, it seems. Uh, so it seems to me that trying to assign individual angels to individual people uh, is 
not something the scripture teaches. Uh, it wouldn't be inconsistent with scripture, but I think that's an overemphasis often made. Okay, one more topic, and then we'll be finished with angels. Who is this angel of the Lord? Okay, let's just take a look at the picture. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 16. Genesis 16. This is where Abram doesn't have a child, and Sarah comes up with this idea. Well, I can't make a baby, so let's have you work with my servant, Hagar, and conceive a baby in her, and we'll count it as ours by adoption kind of thing. And so he does that. Uh, probably not a good idea. And the story comes out, it's really a bad idea. Hagar begins to look down on Sarah because she can't make a baby. And after the baby's born, Sarah torments Hagar. It's just, oh my gosh, bad idea. And I could make comments on uh, some of the ways that people are using uh, donor children and surrogate moms and such. It just, gosh, it's fraught with difficulty, huge difficulties that happens here. But what happens here is that Hagar runs away from Sarah because she's being so mistreated and the power differential between the wife of the landowner and the Egyptian slave. Look at verse 7. The angel of the Lord, Malak Yahweh, found Hagar near a spring and said to her, where have you come from? Where are you going? She says, I'm running from mistress. So the, again, angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress. Verse 11, the angel of the Lord said to her, you're now pregnant, you'll bear a son, and then gives this incredible blessing to Ishmael. Incredible blessing to Ishmael. Talks about him being a, uh, uh, there'll be a battle with, uh, with his brothers, but huge, huge, huge blessing on Ishmael. But look what happens here. Verse 10, 11, or verse 9, 11, it's the angel of the Lord. But at verse 13, she gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. No, wait, 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 wait. I thought it was the angel of the Lord. But here in verse 13, it's the Lord. And she names him, you are the God who sees me. I have now seen the one who sees me. And he... No, the angel Lord becomes the Lord? Like, what's that about? Look at another one, Genesis, or, uh, Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3. This is very famous burning bush syndrome. <laughs> Verse 2, the angel Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire within the bush. So it's the angel of the Lord appears. But then at verse 4, when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look. Angel Lord? Or is it the Lord? You know, an angel is a created being, a personal servant. The Lord is the God who creates all things. Like, what is this? And as you follow through, you can use your concordance. The angel Lord appears a lot of times, and it often is apparently God, like in these two stories. Who is this angel of the Lord? seems to me, seems to me, and many others, that this is the second person of the Trinity. Uh, this is the one who will become incarnate as Jesus. And one of the interesting things that's happened, this word angel, malak, can mean messenger, or it could even be message. Uh, so we could use a loose translation and say this angel Lord could be loosely the messenger of the Lord, that's for sure, or it could be the message of the Lord, or it could be the word of the Lord, loosening up the translation a bit. And of course, the word of the Lord, that's the word in John chapter 1, who is with God forever. So there seems to be a connection there, and certainly the angel Lord and God come back and forth between each other. And so I'm, with, I'm one of many who would say that when we see the angel of the Lord, that that's actually the one, the second person of the Trinity, fully God, that's why he can become God, but he is the messenger of God, thus the angel of the Lord. Now, one other passage, Genesis 22. This is one of those mind-bending passages 
where God tests Abram by saying, slaughter your son, slice him up, and burn him as an act of worship to me. Unthinkable. And he does that. He takes him up on Mount Moriah, which is, as we see in Second Chronicles, that's Temple Mount later on. This is the place where the temple is going to be us Mount Zion. It's also the place where our Lord is crucified, and Isaac carries wood up the mountain. When they get to the top, uh, it's one of these strange things where he binds his son, laid him in the altar, and reaches out to take his hand and slay his son. So he's about to sacrifice his son. And verse 11, the angel of the Lord, there's that same one, Malach Yahweh, calls out to him and says, don't do it. Now, Isaac represents Jesus. Yah uh, Abraham represents Yahweh. The angel of the Lord, if that's the second person of the Trinity who's become an incarnate in Jesus, there's a sense in which he's going to say, <laughs> stop, no, no, the prophecy's done. That's my job. Laughter will not die on this mountain, but I, the angel of the Lord, who is incarnate as Jesus, I will die on this mountain as a sacrifice for sin. And that's why in verse 14, that place is called Yahweh, Yaira, the Lord will provide. Interesting connection here with the angel of the Lord. A lot of stuff in angels. Um, so you have uh, that they're servants, they're personal, created, uh, they're judgment, they're messengers. But this angel Lord is a very interesting picture who is more than just an angel. He is a messenger of the Lord, but he is God himself. So when we look at this kind of thing, what do we do with angels? Uh, they show up from time to time. They do their work. There's never a place in Scripture that we call for angels to help us. But angels are around, and I think a lot of times we don't see them, just like Elisha's servant doesn't see them. And there are those occasional times when God opens our eyes and we can see an angel, or an angel brings us a message, as it does to, uh, to Mary. Now, here's the thing. If an angel shows up to bring you a message, you've got to test it and be sure it's one of the good angels because they're evil angels as well. And they pretend to be good angels a lot of times. But we're going to do that in another video. So, ponder angels, see them as God's messengers, God's servants, but worship God and Him only.